The largest military assault in the history of mankind begins on a front 2,400 kilometers wide, stretching across the territory of Soviet Russia. The bombing of airfields and railways and of advancing Russian troops. German troops crossed the border and entered Estonia on the 16th day of the war on July 7, 1941. The Estonian people were filled with the hope that they would be liberated from the horrors of the Red Year and that Estonian independence would be restored. Estonian men, resistance fighters, some six to seven thousand forest brothers, as they were known, managed to liberate much of Estonia. Then the German attack got bogged down. This gave the Red Army time to press 33,000 men into service in northern Estonia. Soviet destroyer battalions employed scorched earth tactics. Troops belonging to destroyer battalions from Latvia entered the part of Estonia where we lived. There were four homesteaders in our farm and someone must have pointed us out and told them we were hiding in the woods. They came looking. On three occasions they came and torched farms. They bayoneted my uncle and cousin and threw them into a local river. My mother asked about my husband's fate. She knew that he'd been shot. On the same day I was arrested on the 3rd of July. I don't know if it was a coincidence or not. Because of a quick advance, destruction of many cultural treasures by the Soviet troops was avoided. It turned out that there had been a mass murder at the Viljan, the prison. I saw it with my own eyes, a big deep square grave in the prison shed. I recall that there were 14 corpses. On top of the heap was a young boy of 12 or 13. He was without his trousers, he had been beaten and was bruised. Hastily we started to reconstitute the home guard. We met a couple of men through Colonel Raudma. He was the chief of the home guard. Attack on Tallinn. A number of young single men were ready to go to war right away. In fact, several of them did. They joined German units and went to the front. Marching into Tallinn. Citizens are greeting our soldiers as liberators from Bolshevik subjugation. German troops along with Forest Brothers arrived in Tallinn on August 28th. The people hoped for the return of independence. Former Prime Minister Ulowatz presented the German command with a memorandum calling for the reinstatement of independence. In a verbal reply they said Germany wouldn't allow governments to be re-established in the occupied eastern territories. Still, the Germans didn't forbid the use of the Estonian coat of arms and flag beside the swastika flag. They didn't ban the national anthem. The symbols were now of extreme importance to the people. Rejoicing, they greeted the German occupiers who had delivered them from the clutches of deporters and killers, not as in Paris a year earlier, where the people had looked on in mute silence as the Germans marched in. The Forest Brothers had already managed to drive Soviet occupation forces out of parts of Estonia. Over 500 resistance members were killed in the fighting. On a local level, the administrative hierarchy of the pre-war Estonian Republic was re-established. Tallinn had been in a state of siege since August the 7th. The communists evacuated by sea. They took lots of valuable items and the men who had been forcibly conscripted in Tallinn with them. Artillery opened fire on them from the coast. 
Clouds of smoke and steam from the burning and sinking ships on the horizon. Warplanes joined in the destruction. 17 warships and 43 troop carriers have been destroyed. Another 54 vessels have been severely damaged. Almost 200 red ships left Tallinn and Paldiski for Kronstadt. A quarter of them were destroyed. The Bolshevik divisions who had fought in Estonia have been destroyed. The battle for Tallinn and Paldiski became the Dunkirk of the Baltic Sea for the Soviets. The roadsides were littered with the abandoned arms and vehicles of the retreating Soviets. Soviet commando units worked feverishly to try to destroy equipment and anything else of utility that might fall into enemy hands. Most of the Soviets were either taken prisoner or they perished in the waters of the Baltic Sea. When the battle was over, about 12,000 prisoners had been taken into custody. This is the causeway that joins the islands of Muhu and Sarema. Over this causeway, partially destroyed by the enemy, Captain Pankov moved with his company of infantry, a decision he took independently from Muhu to the eastern part of Sarema, and thereby created the conditions for successful action in conquering the island. The Germans took possession of the Estonian islands in September and October. Sites of mass murders committed by the Reds had already been discovered on the mainland. Red terror had claimed the lives of 2,200 victims in Estonia, of all ages. Most of them were killed after the beginning of the war. Attack on Kuresare, the capital of Sarema. This is Kuresare, an ancient castle of a German order of knights. Sarema was under Soviet control the longest. They carried out more crimes there. In 1941, the Soviets had tortured people at the castle. I saw that too. I attended high school during the German period. To see the victims was awful. It makes me sick even now. I couldn't stay there more than a minute. I left. The hands of most of the women were tied behind their backs with barbed wire. The women's breasts had been amputated. Some were still hanging there. Pins had been pushed into their noses. One had pins under each of her fingernails, where it's the most painful. They were in the well of the courtyard, where there is an old cellar facing the seaside, and in a number of other cellars. One of the wells was completely full of bodies. There was another big cellar where a hunting club is now situated, and they had tortured people there too. During the German period, couches were on display, all covered with blood and traces of stabbing where people had been bayoneted. The couches were riddled with holes, the springs were showing. A party was thrown for the members of the town Komsomol. They didn't know that an orchestra was playing where the hunting club is now, and right there underneath, to drown out the screaming of people, they were made to dance. Ninety people were found killed in Kuresare, mainly in the courtyard of the castle. The dead were removed to the courtyard, and I went to see. It made me nauseous. I thought it just can't continue like this. I joined voluntarily to avenge their deaths. We were sent to Russia in the month of April. First we went to Odova. At the beginning of the war, high and mighty Greater Germany didn't need any reinforcements of its military forces. Estonian volunteers were assigned to patrol in the rear in Russia. A Waffen-SS unit of Estonian volunteers. Two of us went from our village. I went with the brother of a guy I'd been in the resistance with. Eight boys were from a neighboring village. There were more of them there. There were leaders and those who set examples, for instance, some man of more than 40. He had been awarded the Estonian Cross of Freedom. He went with his son. They set an example for us. When I was young, he had been to our school telling us stories about the War of Independence. 
In autumn of 1941, six security battalions, so-called Eastern battalions, and six police battalions were formed. In the winter battles that followed, it turned out that they would have to display their courage at the front. As autumn arrived in Estonia, the units of the resistance were replaced by a new self-defense force. Eventually, it would consist of 37,000 men. The new occupying power confiscated all so-called property of the Soviet Union, everything that had been nationalized during the Red Year. Farmers were merely granted use of their land. Enterprises went into the hands of the Germans. Farms had compulsory norms. A townsman, an Estonian, received the ration of 240 grams of bread and 35 grams of meat daily. Industrial goods were unavailable even with a special purchase permit. Everything was put into the service of the German wartime economy. Farmers brought milk and I had to be out there every day. I had long working days and it was good to be at work. I had butter there, I won't deny it, that we packaged. The foreman would say that I was mismanaging my milk. He'd ask how come I distributed more milk than my documents allowed, but I was like that. I knew who had children in their families, and I always poured an extra drop. We received a fair amount of bread, even though it was rationed, and even some meat, but I remember that it was not much. But still, we did receive some meat. The Germans formed Ostland, the eastern region made up of the occupied Baltic countries in Belarus. Its administration included an Estonian general commissariat headed by the SA general Litzman. In September, an indigenous civil administration was established headed by Director General Hjalmar Mae. Dual mechanisms of government meant German supervision. Greater Germany had plans for new Europe, but all the way to the very end it was unclear what lay in store for the Estonian people. Their destiny was supposed to depend on their contribution to the war effort. Stories about Greater Estonia envisaged the resettlement of Estonians to the east beyond Lake Peipus. From January 1942 onwards, young people from the Baltic countries were recruited to Germany for civilian service. They said this was the first phase of Germanizing the young. Meanwhile, Estonian men who had been taken to Russia were suffering in units called labor battalions. In 1942, Red Army units consisting of Estonians were formed. The battles of Veliki and Luki would cost the Estonian Rifle Corps about half of its strength. All able-bodied and healthy men were screened. He wrote their names down. An army unit consisting of Estonians was being formed, and we were asked if we wanted to go. Well, who wouldn't have? Of course we wanted to, in order to stay alive. You would have been dead the next day if you had continued to stay in the conditions they had us living in. In the battles near Velikia Luki, a bigger troop of Estonian men managed to were dragooned into the Red Army in 1941. In March of 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill concluded the Atlantic Charter, providing guarantees of pre-war borders. The Soviet Union joined in September. However, at the Tehran Conference at the end of 1943, the Allies promised Stalin the borders of 41, thereby also ceding the Baltic states to him. Nothing is being left behind that could be useful to the enemy. On the 14th of January 1944, the Red Army seized the initiative on the Leningrad Novgorod front, and within a week's time the Germans began to retreat in panic. On February 2nd, the Red Army crossed the frozen ice of the Narva River in Estonia. This is one of the planned withdrawal movements, the practical importance of which even our enemy knows. Convoys are on their way through Narva in a completely orderly fashion. Thousands of civilians are joining them. A post moved forward on the bank of the Narva River. 
The high command of the German army planned to retreat quickly from Estonia to the Veina River line. Leader of the Estonian Home Administration, Dr. May, announced a general mobilization. With the approval of the military command, Hjalmar May called up all men born between 1904 and 1923 for military service. To do so in an occupied country was a violation of international law. Even earlier men had been pressed into German service, but these efforts hadn't provided the needed manpower. Now in this situation of great danger, former Prime Minister Yuri Ulowatz also lent his support to the mobilization in a radio broadcast. Thousands of new combatants joined in the fight against the encroaching Soviet forces. Imminent danger galvanized three times more men than needed, 45,000 in all. Fresh units filled the breach at the crumbling front at the decisive moment. The men fought to prevent a second Soviet occupation. They were afraid it would imperil the entire Estonian nation. German grenadiers along with Estonian volunteers are repelling the attack of the Soviet troops. Rikikula was taken back on the 24th of February. Sivertsi, Vepskula and Vasa were left. They constituted a Soviet bridgehead. There were minefields ahead. You couldn't simply proceed. You had to force your way in somewhere and enter into a trench. It was up to us to go forward with bayonets and hand grenades. Mennik, the first man into the trenches of Rikikula, cleaned them out with hand grenades. A step ahead and around the next corner, then a burst of fire, then forward and around the next corner again. The trenches were laid out in a zigzag fashion, ever onward with hand grenades. That's how you'd roll them up. Another Bolshevik assault was thwarted on the Narva front. We volunteered for the attack, but we didn't throw caution into the winds. We had healthy respect for our foes. Grenadiers are fighting in the Latvian and SS brigades. These units are repelling all attacks of the numerically superior Bolshevik forces in the Narva sector and are putting up successful resistance. Soviet positions that have been taken. I was given clean hospital garb in the morning. I had already come back to consciousness and recovered my faculties. They put flowers on the table and what not. I only remember it vaguely, it was so long ago. I fell asleep at noon. When I opened my eyes, I saw high-ranking officials pushing in through the door. I didn't know that they would come to me, but they did. I remember Litzmann being there and Hausberger and May and Sodla. There were many of them. Violent battles were fought on the Narva front in early 1944. The Soviet Air Force bombed Estonian towns with Tallinn coming under very serious attack on March the 9th. The people's fighting spirit was high, even though it was obvious that Estonia's future was grim. The movement for the restoration of independence gained momentum. Underground resistance groups had been formed. They were in touch with Estonian politicians in exile in Sweden. Ribbentrop had discussed autonomy for Estonia as early as 1943. The Estonians decided to pursue independence instead. On the 23rd of March 1944, the resistance groups formed the National Committee of the Republic of Estonia, headed by Karel Lidak. They wanted to re-establish the Republic. A wave of arrests followed in April. Almost 230 prominent Estonians were jailed. The activities of the National Committee weren't stepped up until July, when a diplomatic representation was established in Stockholm. Ex-Minister Otto Tief was elected chairman of the National Committee. Yuri Ulowatz assumed the duties of the president. The movement for independence hoped that it would be possible to keep the front from advancing into Estonia until the end of the war. 
Hopes were placed on the Atlantic Charter and on the help of the Western democracies. Admiral Pitka began to organize the nucleus of armed forces that the future government of the Republic could rely upon. The fascist barbarians are still dominating over there. Red Army units are assembling to liberate Narva, an industrial town with a glorious past, which embodies the historical friendship and cooperation that exists between the Estonian and Russian peoples. The artillery arm of the Estonian National Corps, the Red Army, is taking part of the battles for the liberation of Narva. The Red Army vastly outnumbered its opponents on the Narva front, especially in terms of armaments. It went on the offensive on July the 24th. The German troops abandoned Narva, which had been reduced to ruins by the Russians. The Red Army was brought to a halt as they reached the Sinima Hills on July 26th. About 60,000 men stood in their way, half of them Estonians. The Red Army lost up to 170,000 men in ferocious battles, and the Russian strategists were reduced to looking for other routes by which to reconquer Estonia. On the 20th of July 1944, while liberating Narva from the clutches of the enemy, our combatants saw a landscape of ruins in place of the town that flourished here before. Forward to Tallinn, forward to the west. Twenty-two-year-old Harald Nugisex, Estonian recipient of the Knight's Cross, spent a few days on leave at his home in an Estonian village. Farmers from the area, the only men left from Karyakula, have come to visit the heroic fighter. Their sons are fighting at the front too to defend their homeland from the Bolshevik avalanche. Despite his close proximity to the battlefield, the farmer harvests the fields. Let this be an example to all of us. For all of us, the war has become something that will not tolerate idle onlookers. Under the protection of arms, the harvest is carried out, literally in the combat zone. The Red Army began a new Estonian offensive from the south in the middle of July, broke through German lines, captured Vuru on August 13th and Tartu on the 25th. The southern front was only lightly manned by German troops. Vuru was made the temporary capital of the Estonian SSR. The 200th Infantry Regiment arrived in Paldiski from Finland on August the 19th at the urging of the National Committee. These 3,000 Estonians had made the choice to fight in Finnish uniform. They were received with great enthusiasm by the people. In the aftermath of the fighting in July and August 1944, the Red Army scoured a big part of the Baltic states for enemies. The towns of Tartu, Vuru, Madonna, Rezekne, Daugavpils, and Shaoliai and Yelgava have already been liberated. Our troops reached this line by September. A major new attack was launched by the Red Army on September 14th. Hitler gave German troops permission to retreat from Estonia on the 18th. Many Estonians in German uniform departed with them. Their choices were limited. After heavy fighting, the Soviet troops of the Third Baltic Front took the city of Balga. In Tallinn on the 19th, the government of the Republic, headed by Otto Tief, assumed its duties. For two days, the Estonian flag was restored to its proper place. The inhabitants of Estonia left their homeland aboard German cruisers. Some 75,000 Estonians were able to flee from the Red Terror, around 50,000 to Germany by sea and by land, and over 20,000 to Sweden, mostly by small boat. Under the protection of German naval forces, merchant ships are safely entering their ports of destination. 6,500 Estonian citizens had been executed by the Nazis, including captured Soviet killers. This figure doesn't include the prisoners of war who died in Estonia and the Jews murdered at Kaleviliva and Kloga. It's been described as an extermination camp. I'd call it a labor camp instead because when the working day was over, the inmates could go to surrounding villages. So they started to come to us too. 
we gave them whatever food there was, potatoes or bread or whatever else we had at the moment. Close relationships developed with a number of people who came to our house repeatedly. But the liquidation of the camp, well, it was a task force. Their arrival took place under the cover of secrecy. The guards who had been there were completely replaced. I came from Tallinn by train at night. I saw lights the night before. The next day I went to see what was going on because there was a pervasive smell of burnt meat that extended for kilometers. The picture that I saw was extremely morbid. Kose Lane was filled with corpses. They shot my husband's two brothers. Then they shot some nine or ten people to death. They shot everyone they came across. It was simply awful when I think back. I wept my eyes out. Suddenly a Russian officer came to talk to me. I don't know Russian, but we had some women there who knew the Russian language, and they translated. Why is this woman crying? Isn't she happy that we come and save you from the Germans? All that I said to him was that my husband was also coming from there, although I hadn't heard anything about him. But wasn't it awful if he too would come like that, with such killing? Marshal Govorov's troops arrived in Tallinn. The advance on Tallinn was an operation as fast as lightning. Our troops battled their way ahead at a pace of over 150 kilometers in two or three days. The capital of Estonia was returned to the Estonian people. The flag of freedom was fluttering again over Tompea, the ancient stronghold of Tallinn. 120,000 Red Army troops invaded Estonia from two directions, including the Estonian Rifle Corps, numbering almost 30,000 men. Opposing them were 60,000 Estonians who had been fighting with the Germans. The Estonians had no heavy arms, there wasn't even a front anymore, just isolated pockets of fighting men. Here and there, Admiral Pitka's fighters put up desperate resistance. Independence wasn't relinquished without a struggle. In reality, Estonia had no real resources with which to defend herself. Tallinn fell on September the 22nd. By the 24th of November, all of Estonia was in their grip. In those desperate days, everyone had his or her own choice to make. Some waited for the Red Army, some got away to the west, others sought refuge in the woods. Many decided to stay at home, come what may.